Hey y'all, welcome to the Coyote Traffic School Podcast, episode number 29. Uh, in this episode, we're going to talk about coyotes, and I'll lead into a couple of the, the reasons that this comes up, but for starters, I wanted to, to read a review. Uh, we got 65 five-star reviews on iTunes, which is awesome. Thank y'all so much for leaving ratings and reviews. Um, that definitely helps other folks find the podcast. And uh, we got a review here from Andrew Thomas Cola. Uh, February 4th says, Keep crushing it, man. Love watching you and your boy getting after it. Can't wait to do it with my little girl one day. And, uh, you know, I get a lot of feedback. If you watch my daily trap line checks, uh, which unfortunately I don't, he doesn't get to run with me all the time, but I got a, I got a son. He's five years old, just turned five. And, uh, you know, so on the weekends when he's not in school or if I, you know, have to, for whatever reason, run traps after work um, and, and he can go with me, uh, you know, I always try to take him along. And he has a lot of fun um, just getting getting out and, and getting um, just experience and everything. And it, a lot of times it's not so much even the animals that we catch, but just letting him walk in the woods or play in the creek or something, you know, He's, you can kind of see his his little bit of independence coming out of, you know, if we walk in to check some traps and we walk back to the truck, he wants to go his way, and he doesn't want me to go the same way he goes. So I'll have to walk a different way, and he'll pick the toughest, most briary, brambly place he can go. But, um, you know, that's all part of him learning and him getting comfortable with being outside and being in the woods. And that's one thing I love, that he's, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't get off, and sometimes I'll get off and kind of hide behind a tree or something and just watch him to see what he'll do. And most of the time, he doesn't even realize that I, he can't see me. You know, he's just off doing his own thing. He's not scared of anything, or, and, and I just love that. I love him, you know, being comfortable with the woods and, and getting in the woods because, uh, you know, I, it amazes me that there's so many people, so many kids that don't aren't – it's stuff we take for granted. Um but there's there's so many kids that aren't exposed to that and you know i i mentioned it on a podcast here uh, a while back but you know i was doing a nuisance job trapping roof rats and and uh the the homeowner's grandkids two grandsons were there one morning when i was checking the traps and they asked if i caught something <laughs> yeah i caught a rat in a mouse and uh, they wanted to see it and it, it, it just they were super amazed she said later on it was a monday and evidently there's mouse trap monday on youtube i guess and she said they were on there looking up all different kind of mouse traps and stuff you know and and uh it just it just blew me away how excited you know they got over seeing and, and the questions that that generated from you know seeing uh, a rat that they had never you know you hear about them but they had never seen it before so um and and that's uh so I, I'm kind of getting off on a tangent here, but I get a lot of I get questions and comments and feedback about folks, you know, taking their kids or getting ready to take their kids or got little ones that they're getting ready to take. And, and uh, man, that's one of the reasons that I love trapping, especially now that I have a son um, and, and a family in general, is that uh, you know at least the way I trap, which is mostly out of my truck, you know, it's easier for them to ride along. It's it's comfortable. I don't have to be walking through the mud and the the swamp all the time, although my son loves that. And there's no doubt next year we'll, we'll have some hip boots for him or maybe some full waders, I don't know. But because, uh, I mean, that's obviously a little boy is going to love that, you know. But uh, or I say obviously, I, I assume that they're going to love that. But um, it's so easy to get them exposed and just, you know, pop out of the truck looking for tracks. And, and uh, so... I don't know. I, I see trapping as a great way to get kids engaged and involved, at least your kids. I mean, uh, and, and, and the potential to take other people on because there's as many adults as are intrigued with trapping as there are kids. Uh, so anyway, I appreciate the review. I appreciate all y'all and, and hope you are enjoying. And one thing that uh, my wife really prepped me for it through with hunting with her when because she had never hunted before. Uh, we got together and uh, but you know, and, and having a, a son and a kid and taking them along, it it's a different pace for sure. Like, you're not long line and you're not punching in as many sets as you can with a five-year-old tagging along, you know, because you're trying to make sure that they aren't flicking boogers everywhere and stepping in traps and eating bait and things like that. So uh, it slows you down, but it's, 
it's more it's even more rewarding just seeing the things that they pick up on than you know out there getting an extra dozen traps in um, so if you got if you got kids or if you got little kids man get them out there because it's a it's a lot of fun and I'm sure y'all all are uh, another thing that I'm super excited about I got a shipment kind of rough looking but I had a, I forgotten that I had a few more beaver tails in the uh, salted that I didn't ship off earlier in the year when I shipped my first batch of uh, leather off so I shipped these off and, and just got these back in some beaver tails and um, mute that and I actually had a bunch more in the freezer uh, that I just got shipped off this week to get tanned so I got a handful back that'll give me something to do when trapping season goes out um, and hopefully it won't be long after that I'll get those other tails in but that's something I'm really looking forward to and I've got a few more ideas on some things that I can try to I'm, I'm gonna try to do uh, having some fur tanning with my leather stuff just to just to try to figure out something to do with with the fur you know especially our southern fur I've talked about it before but it's not super valuable um, from a fur market perspective but um, it's it's I think there's still a place for it and if we kind of get creative I think we can come up with some things that that people would appreciate so I I got some of that in the works and I'm, I'm excited about um, I'm excited about that and, and another thing that makes me think about that and it really gets me intrigued about that is you know talking about getting people involved in trapping and, and interested in trapping um, just thinking about how how big of a barrier that's got to be for people if you don't have anybody to sell your fur to especially if you can only like with Napa which you can ship um, you can ship green fur to Napa and they'll flesh it and put it up for you um, but obviously that's if you're shipping it up there that's a huge shipping cost and you know most of the I don't know how I don't know how the reps I've never talked to them about that Napa will definitely take it and you get charged for it but honestly it's not a it's a pretty reasonable fee um, from from the price that I looked at a while back of doing that so uh, but I don't know so far as the local reps and getting that up there I don't know how they would handle that um, but I, I know that's got to be that's got to be a concern and an issue for somebody even if they're just trapping you know, if they're just wanting to get into you know setting up a dozen dog proofs around their corn feeders and catching raccoons with their kids still they're still gonna have the question of what do I do with these when I catch them um, you know and, and if they had somebody that would buy them whole that would be awesome and and at the, at the very least if they had somebody that would buy them green because uh, you know like like I've talked about so many times is um, w with different things like the trap modification you know all this stuff takes time and you know when you got a family and all you don't have as much time and uh, so you know, I could definitely appreciate the guys that are skinning a uh, skinning and just throwing them in the freezer and, and wanting, needing to sell uh, green hides because um, you know fur put up just like every other piece of of uh, trapping is is very time consuming so uh, but anyway stay tuned stay on the lookout for for uh, some more leather items I'm, I'm pretty excited about about uh, messing with that again and and uh, seeing what I can do and where that'll go so all right we're gonna get into the meat of the topic here um, coyotes and specifically I want to talk about home ranges and um, just kind of the habits of, of coyotes and it's kind of the same thing that brings this up but uh, you know the one of the properties that I'm trapping this year that I've trapped this year uh, when I went out there and took a look at it with a landowner he uh, he mentioned that uh, somebody else had trapped the property about three years ago and it's another guy that uh, seems to be kind of well known in my area and I, I don't know if I've kind of uh, maybe crossed paths with with uh, him in the past but uh and I landed on told me he said yeah so and so trapped in here about three or four years ago and uh, he caught 18 coyotes in 12 days and man I just that kind of rubs me raw right off the get because I didn't catch 18 coyotes last season just being honest um, you know I'm not a I'm not a full-time long line trapper and um, you know unless somebody in the south is getting paid for the services of trapping they ain't full-time long line trappers either I mean even you know even the guys that are that are selling to the live market um, you know I mean it, trapping ain't paying 
all the bills. Uh, but uh, that, like I said, that just, we're talking 500 acres too now, not 5,000, not 50,000, 500 acres um, that supposedly 18 coyotes in 12 days were crap pan. My traps have been out there pushing 12 days right now and I've caught one coyote. I've caught a boatload of coons now. I could, uh, I, I'm the, I'm the coon, coon, the dean of the coon trapping academy right now, I feel like, but, uh, and, and I've had that, and, and y'all may have had that situation too, you know, I've had that, a landowner I trapped for right after I first started trapping when I was in high school still, and, uh, I knocked on this farmer's door, he owned about 500 acres, and it was all cattle ground, um, had a, a big creek running through the middle of it, and there was a little bit of hardwood on both sides of the creek, otherwise it was all pasture. And I trapped it pretty hard. Um, and granted, I was I was new and still getting used to it, but I think I caught three coyotes out of there about two weeks or so, something like that. And uh, <clears throat> heck, I, I felt like I did pretty good, you know. And I don't know, a couple years later, I wound up seeing the, the farmer in restaurant one day and talking to him, just you know, kind of keeping in the loop and making sure he remembered me knew who I was. And he said, "Yeah, I had somebody come in here and caught like." 25 coyotes last year, something like that. I don't remember exactly how many it was, but it was something like that. Man, I just, in my mind, I was like, you got, I hope you didn't pay them because you just got scammed. And I, I kind of stand by that, but at the same time, I kind of hate to say that. And the reason is, is in certain areas, that's possible. You know, I know there's people, there's there's certain areas, certain locations where there's transition zones or, or court, special corridors or whatever where, for whatever reason, it's just like a coyote funnel. And there's just a lot of interaction, a lot of moving around, and you can catch a lot of coyotes in a, in a very um, centralized area. But that's not every cattle farm in the southeast, northeast, west, wherever. Um, you know, those are very specific locations and it's not something that you're going to run into that often um, in my experience um, and so and you know trappers I guess kind of wanting to make sure people know they're doing a good job or think they know what they're doing or something I, I ran into it with beavers where you know some lady pays some guy $50 a beaver to catch beavers out of her 10 acre fish pond and he comes up with 30 beavers really and I mean that I hate that because that's not doing anything but shooting us in the foot as trappers and it sure doesn't make anybody that comes in after the fact like myself feel good when the landowners got an expectation of this and here I am barely squeaking by you know with anything um, so and, and I, I get questions a lot about man I've had traps out two weeks and I haven't had any activity what do I do should I move them should I this and that uh, and so that's why I wanted to I wanted to touch on this and I, I wanted to get some data and so what I did was I looked through it and that's it can bore you to death honestly but if you get on Google Scholar and start looking um, just just search coyote home range coyote habitat um, things like that and you can find papers and now these are peer-reviewed um, research articles so this is not just Bill Jenkins writing something. I'm just making that up. I hope that's no writer's name, but this is not Joe Smo writing an article about coyotes and outdoor life. This is this is research that's been conducted through a university. It's been funded, and um, it's it's been peer reviewed. So there have been multiple professors that were in on this, as well as whoever the uh, the journal is. Typically, it's journals because that's real professional sounding. That publish it like the wildlife society bulletin or the wildlife society journal or um it's there there's pretty rigorous um criteria that papers have to um, meet in order to get in these publications so um these are and, and they're written very technical they're not written like an outdoor life article or fur fishing game article i mean they're not just for fun reading but and it, honestly some of them are kind of confusing but they're, um, you know, when I was getting my wildlife degree, that was something that, that we got exposed to a lot was, you know, different research articles and, and different kinds of research and stuff. And honestly, it's one thing that I kind of, uh, I would have loved to have gotten a, a master's in wildlife, master of science, 
Um, but man, just the research really rubbed me wrong because, um, you know, you didn't necessarily, you kind of had to take what was funded. You couldn't just say, well, I want to research coyotes. If there's nobody paying money for any kind of certain coyote research, then you're stuck doing whatever other research is available. And there's a lot of research that doesn't really have any kind of management implications. It's just to answer some question that somebody came up with because they could get $100,000 to get it funded. And it's a waste of time and money, if you want my personal opinion. Some of it's good. And, and this this right here, this all this information that I'm fixing to go through is, is research-based and it's, it's very um, valuable, I feel like. And so um, it's, it's gonna get kind of dense and it's gonna be me reading because it's a lot of numbers, but uh, I'll kind of, hopefully it's gonna be engaging enough and, and interesting enough that you can keep track and pay attention. And so this is several different studies. Um, and this, these are all relatively recent studies. Some of them I've got the dates on them, not all of them. But that's one thing that you can do in that Google Scholar is look from 2016, from now to back to 2016, you can set a time frame. And there's actually in the last, five to 10 years, there's been a fair amount of coyote research, especially in the Southeast, because of the perception that coyotes may be having an impact on the deer herds. And so there's been some money allocated for that. And so there's been a, a good bit of research lately uh, across the Southeast uh, about coyotes and attaching GPS collars and radio collars. And so that's one of the reasons I got, I got, a, I looked in the NTA on their National Trapper Association website and they've got a handbook and they have a little, um, outline of you know biology of each fur bear and so they list coyotes as uh, home ranges uh, female coyotes having a home range of five to eight square miles which is roughly three thousand to five thousand acres and uh, I know any of the folks that are listening are out west you probably relate square miles pretty good but most of the folks in the east and southeast acres is what we deal in day to day and so I and uh, a lot of the research stuff is in square kilometers because it's all research and I converted all that to acres. So uh, mature males, they've got up to 30 to 40 square miles. So that's 20,000 to 25,000 acres. Um, that's a lot of ground to cover. And uh, that's why I, I, keep, I keep justifying things, but that's why I wanted to get these get some of these this data from this research is because <clears throat> I don't know when when that NTA information was updated what specifically it is probably for Western coyotes honestly um, you know because coyote research in the east is, is a pretty recent thing because coyotes in the east are a pretty recent thing and so I came upon a couple of articles uh, one of them in the Northeast and so it was in like Connecticut Massachusetts somewhere and um, so there's several criteria and I'll read them off. So the average home range size for a breeding for breeding adult coyotes was just over 7,000 acres. For resident males, it was larger. So it was 90, about 9,500 acres. And for resident females, it was smaller, about 5,800 acres. So that's where you get your average range of about 7,300 acres. Um, and now, those two were both residents. So there's a classification that you'll kind of see in some of this stuff of residents and transients. And so residents is, is a basically kind of a, a mated pair that's established a home range and they kind of break it out on criteria just based on the smaller home ranges. Um, and then you've got transients, which, and I don't know that it was I don't think these many of these coyotes were aged, so I don't know um, if that is a correlation, but um, if that's just an assumption that the transients, from my assumption, my assertion, not, not the, the research, but I would assume that's probably mainly young males, but also potentially young females um, that have kind of just been booted out of the, the, uh, the den, so to speak, and so they're out looking for a place to set up and call home. And so those are ones that's gonna cover a lot more ground looking for a true home range that they can establish and or take over and, and live in. Um, and so there for your resident males and resident females, 
about 7,300 acres. For your tran a transient male, they they tracked, and these are radio collared or GPS collared. Um, they track that the area that that coyote traveled to 37,000 acres, and uh, so that's where you know undoubtedly that coyote's looking for somewhere, and he travels and finds one spot, and then realizes. Bob and Sally got this place set up and Bob runs him off and so he's traveling again and he's just looking for some place where nobody's occupying where he can set up shop and, and call his own is, is my assumption um, and so that's what I don't know what the what the range is from when a when a, a transient becomes a resident but presumably it's you know whenever they find a, a vacated territory or something like that then they'll set up shop so that's in the Northeast a lot of y'all are listening in the southeast where I'm at and so I've got actually a breakdown of several different states that's pretty interesting and uh, you know the the sample sizes on these things are a little bit different and so you know none of this is is solid blanket for everything but this is just kind of some general guidelines of you know what has been shown in the past through research and through observation so in this this study Mississippi coyotes that were collared and tracked averaged 3,600 acres. Georgia coyotes averaged 2,500 acres. Florida coyotes averaged 6,100 acres. Alabama coyotes averaged 6,700 acres. Here's another, and, and this goes to show the, uh, you know, the variance. And you know, having having just a couple coyotes collared doesn't really give you a, a true. It, it can get be a lot of variation. Another set of Mississippi coyotes collared averaged over 8,000 acres. Um, and then South Carolina, some coyotes in the, the kind of the river bottoms, river swamp of South Carolina along the Savannah River, 7,600 acres. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty big swing. And now, you know, one thing that could play into that too is habitat. So you look at Mississippi, and you've got, you know, southern Mississippi that's more fur forested, more wooded. And you get over into western Mississippi along the Mississippi River Delta, and you've got wide open, huge ag fields. You know, thousands of acres of ag fields. And so um, that right there can be a huge, um, huge impact on how a coyote uses that landscape because, you know, during during the summer during the growing season when there's crops planted across all of that that's a lot of a lot of presumably habitat although it's a lot of habitat undoubtedly how how good it is what quality it is may be debatable because it may be a seat of cop of corn or whatever but those farmers you know all that stuff they're sprayed underbrush so there's not a lot of um underbrush for rabbits and and uh mice and rats and things like that things that coyotes eat to to live in and then you take that one step further and when all that stuff gets cut over and you're in the dead of winter and there's not a stick out there over this high for miles that's not good habitat for anything either so and I, i'm just making some assumptions here from this data because you've got you know two mississippi data points that one's almost twice what the other one was and so just making that point that all this is habitat dependent and those coyotes that live in the delta they're probably covering more ground to because there's not as much productive ground available if that makes sense um so then a, a part of that study again there was a couple of transients that were tracked and uh one of them covered 20,000 acres and the other one 34,000 acres so there again that's coyotes that are constantly running constantly roaming and so you take the average of all those without the transients that average is right at 5,000 acres so you think about that for a minute if you say that a, the average coyote has a home range of 5,000 acres and say it's a say it so if it's residents likely it's a pair right a mated pair so you're looking at a male and a female and potentially last year's pups depending on when you start so say it's six right so say you got a male and a female and four pups you're talking about six coyotes on 5,000 acres 
don't know about y'all, but none of the properties that I trap are 5,000 acres big. You know, and I'm lucky to get a 500 acre track. You know, that's a big track. So you're talking about, you know, expecting to go out there and catch a, a coyote every night or 18 coyotes on that 500 acres. Like I said, unless you've got some major feature, um, a, a large river, gas line, train track, something that may be a dispersal route or a travel corridor, that's just not realistic for the most part. And so I, that's kind of what I wanted to hit at and hit on is that, you know, folks getting discouraged. And I, I'm saying this as myself at the top of that pack. You know, I've been, I've had those traps out on that 500 acres and caught one coyote so far. And that's hugely discouraging. And um, I'll tell you, just kind of from my personal experience and what I kind of like to set for myself as a target is if I can catch one coyote for every 100 acres that I'm trapping, I consider that a pretty good job. So, um, you know, if I can catch, and, and uh, it's going to take me a couple more weeks, obviously, but if I can catch four more coyotes off of that 500-acre track, I feel like I, you know, covered that pretty well and did pretty good. Um, so that's, and that's totally anecdotal. There is no scientific backing for that at all, but that's just kind of over the years of trapping and seeing, you know, what I've caught off of different properties. Um that's kind of what I've said in my mind as a realistic expectation. And then, you know, looking at these, looking at these, these data points and these numbers, that just reinforces that, that man, there's not, in most cases, there's not coyotes running that 500 acre, that 300 acre, that 1,000 acre track every night. Um, so, Hopefully that makes sense to y'all and, and hopefully that kind of resonates with you so far as what you've seen. Um, I, I'd be really interested to see, you know, your thoughts on what your expectations are of, you know, when you set up a property, how many coyotes do you plan to, how many coyotes do you expect to catch off of that property? Because um, that's one thing. And, uh, you know, I, I talked before and it's definitely something that's, that's high on my list of things to do this year is to try to take some coyote trapping instruction from somebody else just to see, because I feel like I'm decent at coyote trapping, but I know there's room to learn. And, you know, I see guys like Mark Zagger that's taking 100 coyotes a season, uh, you know, trapping three or four weeks a year. And uh, I'd like to figure that out. I'd like to, not necessarily, I'd, I'd love to catch 100 coyotes, don't get me wrong, but uh, just to have a better, better, more comfort level with when I go and, and set a place. You know, is there anything that these guys are doing different? There's got to be something that these guys are doing different than I'm doing to make them more productive and more efficient. You know, I, I, I showed a little clip on my uh, trap line videos the other day of a trail camera that I had set on a, on a trap and got a clip of a coat breezing right by, didn't check up, never even turned his head. You know, he was just cruising. And, uh, you know, undoubtedly, you're going to get those. You're not going to catch every coyote unless you're, you're doing it for a living and, and you're doing uh, damage control work. And uh, then you're going to spend a lot of time probably in most cases trying to catch that very last coyote. But um, in general, we're not going to catch every coyote. But I definitely feel like I'm leaving more on the table than I could. So that's a totally different tangent, a totally different subject. But... Um, I didn't convert these numbers, but here's another specific to Georgia. Um, I think this is 12.4 kilometers, which is probably about 3,000 acres, and then 10.1 is again about 2,500 acres. So, a couple of studies in Georgia, right around that 3,000 acre mark. Um, then there's a there's a 2018 study that was done, uh, a three-state study. I think this was out of the University of Georgia. It's uh, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina doing looking at some large tracks and, and re GPS collaring coyotes. And uh, I actually listened to one of the guys that's kind of the coordinator of this three-state study at the QDMA headquarters last spring, I think. He was there talking, you know, a little bit about research and coyotes and their impacts on deer herds. It was really interesting. 
But um, from from there from that study, so they uh, they collared 147 coyotes. They determined that about 60 of those were residents. They didn't turn about it was 60 of those what what they classified as residents. So that's 41 percent. 48 transients, 27 percent, and then 39 of both, 27 percent. And so I don't know. I didn't. I didn't read. I should have printed the paper off. I didn't read in this into this to see um, how long the study was. But I wonder if that that classification of both isn't what I was talking about. Transients that were transient until they found a home range, and then they were able to kind of narrow down and, and be committed to a smaller area instead of having to steady travel. Excuse me. <sighs> um. So they kind of classified the, the residents as large home range, or the residents as small home ranges, and the transients as large home ranges. And uh, let's see. I guess this is a weighted average. I should have printed this paper off. Uh, I was just kind of jotting some notes. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I did. I did make some more notes. Um, that's a different. That's a different study though. But anyway, so the average home range for, for those 147 coyotes was 3,335 acres. Uh, the smallest was 1,334 acres, and the largest was 9,686 acres. So you're ranging from 1,000 to 10,000 acres of, of home range size that, that these coyotes, 147 coyotes, ranged in between. And so I think that's a weighted average because the average is 3,300, excuse me, which is closer to the 1,300 than it is the 9,000. So I think that's a weighted average. But one thing that they added in to, uh, into their criteria was a core area. And so that was one thing that, the, that he talked about at the uh, QDMA headquarters was a core area and uh, the core area their average core area was right at 800 acres so that's saying that you know these coyotes may run and, and kind of patrol 3300 acres but they they spend more of their time on that 800 acres that core area um, and I don't know exactly what drives that if that's um, you know, food source that that core area can move. Uh, but one thing that was really interesting that that, uh, that guy, I, I wish I could remember his name, but the, he talked about, uh, you know, because there's questions around predator control, obviously. That was kind of what the talk was about. And kind of his opinion, and this I don't think this, this had any research to this specific point, but his opinion was that if you got a property with resident coyotes that those coyotes are probably having more of an impact on a deer herd, or on your local deer herd than if you just got transient coyotes passing through. So if you get trail camera pictures of coyote pups then that may be a good indication of you're in, your coyotes are calling your area, your track, whatever, their core area. And so, you know, if that's where they're raising their pups and rearing their pups, because when they, when they start, when they have pups, you know, that female and those pups, especially while they're still young, they're not going to venture far. So that means that that male and female coyote are probably hunting those areas, that core area a lot harder to feed those pups versus a property that you just get, you know, you never really see any pups on. You just see, you know, grown or kind of juvenile coyotes passing through. Um, you know, those coyotes that are covering twenty to thirty thousand acres, they ain't got a whole lot of time on a five hundred acre track to be hunting it hard. You know, so they're gonna they're gonna move on through and you know be more opportunistic probably on on their hunting or eating versus the resident coyotes that are probably going to be more um, specific in their hunting in their area that they're hunting. 
and talking about that core area, I just just thought about this, but the core area right at 800 acres, that kind of aligns with my kind of anecdotal target of a coyote per 100 acres. Because if you figure, if you figure a good a good year um, and, and healthy coyotes, if you got a male and a female and four young, that's six coyotes on 800 acres. That's that's you know almost one to 100. So. Um, I'm just throwing that in there for free for you. That's a, that's just a little, a little, uh, a little freebie. It's totally out of my brain. Nothing else. But, um, and then one last study. This was done in Georgia, in kind of uh, West Georgia, on a 20,000 acre tract, and they classified coyotes as small home range coyotes and large home range coyotes. Small home range being resident coyotes, and the large home range being transient coyotes. The average home range for all coyotes was 15,000 acres. Average home range for the small home range coyotes or the resident coyotes was 4,700 acres. And the average home range for the large home range coyotes or transient coyotes was 30,000 acres. So you can see there again, <clears throat> that's a huge gap, but I mean, looking across the south at the different research, that 5,000 acre home range is, is pretty consistent. Um, you know, looking at looking at the those uh, those home ranges for the the, several, the multiple states, Mississippi, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, South Carolina, Mississippi, without the transients is right at that 5,000, 5,092 acres is actually what it works out to. And then this one saying 4,700 acres. So I'd say if you're traveling anywhere across the South, that's a, that's a pretty safe bet. That's a pretty good bet. I've also got some got some other notes here that I just jotted down. So one of them is um, taken from this particular study is residents often occupy more productive habitat and the transients avoid the residents. So there there's twofold reasons why the transients are covering more ground. One, the habitat's not as productive, so they're having to track, cover more ground to eat. And then they're also avoiding residents, so they're covering ground, trying not to run into a fight, right? Excuse me. And then <clears throat> another note of more productive habitat is better game deer habitat as well. So residents could have a larger impact on deer populations. Just what I was saying. So, you know, if you, <coughs> you know, you're managing for deer, good habitat is going to be good habitat for everything, right? If it's good habitat for deer and it's growing plenty of deer and rats and rabbits and all that. There's going to be coyotes that take up shop there because it's a good place to hunt. That's where you or I would hunt if we were, you know, we'd rather hunt on somewhere with good habitat than not good habitat, right? Um, and then this last note, I'm trying to figure out what I read here. The area of greater abundance of deer and similar coats. Between sites, recruitment was lower on the site with more deer. So coats may recognize areas with better habitat and hunt them harder during fawning season. This recruitment was low. so so there again talking about the good habitat if there's good habitat and there's a good deer population there's actually been studies that showed that recruitment which is the number of fawns that make it to an adult deer was lower on those sites with more deer so that means if there's more deer that, and it's good habitat. Those coyotes again are keying in on that good habitat, and they're hunting that harder, especially during fawning season when they know that there's plenty more food on the ground. Um, and I've got another. I want to get into another podcast talking more about the uh, the diet of coyotes, and uh, because I think there's some misconceptions there, and I think it's pretty interesting. And it's interesting how it changes and tracks from uh, season to season. Um, but but even in, in, in all the research that's been done regarding coyotes and deer, coyotes' impact on deer, the major impact on deer has been with fawns. And, you know, coyotes can definitely take down adult deer, but their main focus is in the two to three weeks when fawns are dropping, that's when they have the most impact. You know, it doesn't take long for fawns to get to where they can avoid coyotes and, and you know, be able to run better. But those first... Those first few days really are the critical time for the fawns to make it through 
and the coyotes know that and they're hunting those times hard so um, you know and, and that plays into if you own a property or you manage a property then that plays into your strategy around predator control and predator management because you know that's saying if it's good habitat if it's producing a lot of game coyotes are going to be in there too and, and other predators undoubtedly too because good habitat is good habitat if it's good for the deer if it's good for the rabbits it's going to be good for the coyotes and good for the coons um, and so um, another thing and I'll, I'll wrap up with this because I, I hope I, I'm not droning on and boring you with all, it's, this is really dry stuff and reading through these papers is not exciting at all um, but uh, if you do want to do, do a little bit more research on it, not all these papers are available. Some of them you have to have a subscription to one of the magazines or the, one of the journals to be able to read them. But a lot of them you can at least read the abstract. And the abstract will give you a quick overview and kind of give you a few of the, the main points. So you can really get all you need or want out of the abstract. Um, but if you, if you do a search, any of them sometimes on the right, they'll show up as a, with a link. And any of those have a PDF link where it's downloadable. You can access the whole thing. So that's kind of what I try to get uh, get to and look at when I'm looking at these. But I highlighted this this uh, one section in one. Uh, this is the Harris. So this is the the 20,000 acre study in Georgia, in, in West Georgia. And uh, let's see. In the in the discussion one of the one of the conclusions and this is just talking about how variable things can be when, when you're talking about predator control so it says for example uh, let's see I'll just read the whole thing because I'm not sure where I should start our results regarding coyote space use may also hold important implications for predator management through coyote removal because transients cover large areas over relatively short in time intervals these animals may serve as population founders in areas vacated by coyotes following removal efforts. So that's just saying that if you get out, you're out there trapping resident coyotes, those transients are looking for exactly that, those types of areas that's good habitat that there's nobody in. So those transients are the ones that's filling the gap when you're taking predators out through trapping or predator management. Um, thus, in areas where transient coyotes are abundant remover, removal effort, efforts may yield marginal or temporary results now I don't know short of you know watching trail cameras and not not seeing pups necessarily on your trail cameras I don't know otherwise how you verify whether you're in a transient coyote area or a resident coyote area but uh, we'll go on back to the paper for example in South Carolina, annual removal rates remain constant among three sites for three consecutive years. So that means this one particular area that where they were trapping, they were removing about the same number of coyotes every year. Not a whole lot of change. And in central Georgia, coyote abundance decreased following the first year of removal, but increased to nearly pre-treatment levels after year two. These results demonstrate how quickly coyotes, perhaps transients, can occupy vacant areas so that just goes back to the the fact that the predator management if, if, if that's seriously what you or what somebody is interested in it, it's not a one-and-done thing it's it's gonna have to be a constant effort year after year to hold those populations down and like I said especially if you're managing managing a property for deer quail turkeys whatever you're managing it so that there's good habitat that's going to be a draw for any of those coyotes that are coming through and so there's always going to be some some coyote ready to step in and fill that void on that good habitat when you take some out um, and i've seen that you know i've had landowners tell me i've come in and trap trap coyotes in an area be tickled to death and i caught some coyotes out of there and uh Two years later, man, there's more coyotes now than when you when you trapped here before, <laughs> and uh, it, I mean it's that coyotes are so prevalent and, and cover obviously so much ground that they quickly find the void and fill it, and, and are ready to do so. So anyway, I hope, like I said, I hope that didn't bore you too much. I hope that gave you some good facts and, and maybe give you a little bit of um, knowledge and 
make you feel a little bit better about not catching a coyote every night. You know, unless you're covering a lot of ground, got a lot of ground covered. Uh, you know, these coyotes that have 5,000 acre home ranges and, you know, a thousand acre core area, they're covering some ground and it's just a, a waiting game in a, in a matter of time, you know, for them to get back around and come through your area again. <laughs> if you miss them, like I obviously did with that coyote that breezed right by my set, then you may be waiting for another couple days till they come back through. So um, my moral of that is just hang in there. If you've got a good area with sign, stick with it because those coyotes are gonna come through, but chances are they're not coming, running those roads every night. And uh, so that's, trapping's a, trapping's a game of patience and, and knowing your quarry. And this, this helps us, hopefully as trappers, to know our quarry better, know our know that, you know, these coyotes are covering a lot of ground, and we've either got to cover a lot of ground, or we've got to give ourselves plenty of time to catch them as they're coming back through. So, anyway, it's getting late. My throat, my voice is kind of getting scratchy, so I'm gonna call that a night. Um, and, and like I said, hopefully, let me let me know what you think about this. I know this is numbers dense and kind of heavy and heady, but. I think there's some things that we can pull out and use out of this research and and uh, hopefully that can be a value and and uh, if you like that I'll try to I'll, like I said I want to I want to do one on some on some food habits and, and eating habits of coyotes I think that'd be really interesting and some other predators as well so uh, give me let me know what you think give me your thoughts hey y'all if you're still trapping I am I got about two weeks left good luck out there on the trap line lay with it and uh, and uh, we'll see you next time